There will be spoilers ahead. Lots of spoilers, so be careful, won't you? Okay, sure, you betcha. Quick, Knut Skalwacker. We got to get to the Ludifisk Falcon with Oli von Svenobi and rescue that dare Princess Lena by golly. Yiminy, I sure hopes we don't run into that dare Durf Clader and his Ludifisk of Doom over there. Or oh, crepes ya. Yeah. The proceeding was, of course, a reading from the 1980 Scandahoovian science fiction epic Fighting Up in Dem Dare Stars by Golly. <laughs> one of a raft of science fiction movies inspired by 1977's Star Wars. <laughs> but did you know that Roger Corman, the featured player in our series Be Like the Corman, also felt the call to create a science fiction epic that just happened to come out the same year as The Empire Strikes Back? Coincidence? Or another example of Corman's visionary genius. Mm. Yes, this week we will be discussing the seminal and semiotic cinematic creation known as Battle Beyond the Stars. I'm your host, Max Ham Salad Levine, <laughs> and over there sucking down the last of the blue milk is Mike Chuchilla the Wookiee Monster Loose. May the Varda be with you, Mike. I prefer Chubachman. <laughs> <laughs> That's from the Jewish Star Wars. Darth, wait a minute. <laughs> it's Han Solo, it's yep. Princess Leia cats. Forget the Death Star, let's shop. <laughs> Light cabers, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> That's Scottish. Oh. <laughs> but before we get into this titan of cinema, we have our poll question. Poll question. Last week, we asked you... What non-actor's performance pleasantly surprised you, and Tommy Wiseau does not count? Degsy O'Brien, of the Degsy O'Brien Mysteries, replies, Tina Turner in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, 1985. Oh, yeah. What could have been a throwaway role as payment for providing some songs for the movie, Tina added dimension and gravitas to her performance with just a few lines and expressions elevating her villain status to iconic. Oh, you know, it. most people, you forget the character's name, which was Auntie Entity. Well, there's a reason for forgetting it. everyone, everyone remembers Tina Turner in that. Well, yeah. She also had a, a chain link dress. <laughs> yes, she did, which weighed like 40 pounds. Mm. Seth Jacobs gives us LeBron James. LeBron James. LeBron James. In, LeBron James. In, <laughs> turn the vine off, please. In Trainwreck. Wow, I, first off, don't know that movie and didn't know he ever did a movie outside of, what is it, Looney, the the remake of the Looney Tunes Eric. basketball movie. <laughs> Which is so good we can't remember the name. I can't re yep, yep, yep. Spaceball? Ah. No, it was it Spaceball? <laughs> no, it could have been, but no. <laughs> don't write us in, we'll remember in about don't, ten minutes. Yeah, we'll, Just, yeah. yeah, we'll be like, oh, right! Yeah. Yeah. Space Jam. Space Jam, that's See, right, the next generation or whatever the hell they called which, it. Which, yeah, it immediately says basketball to me, because jam equals yeah, basketball. Yeah. Mm, delicious Space Jam. Mm, space flavor. Dave! Dave! <laughs> responded with Salman Rushdie on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. Wow, I might say Truman Capote in Murder by Death, but it would be untrue. Oh, <laughs> burn! Dave Burn! Uh oh. Ouch. Dan Schaefer of the law firm Dan Schaefeloff. <laughs> not a film, but Mark Marin had a role on an episode of Reservation Dogs. Oh god, yeah, he did. And was surprisingly good at it. Hmm. I thought it I thought it was him, but I had a lot of is that really Mark Marin? Until I could confirm it in the episode credits. Huh. Oh. That's a good one. Yep. Neat. Nick Hoffman says Robin Williams in The World According to Garp, his first movie lead. Huh. Up till that point, he was just insanely funny. And then there was this. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's reasonable. He was just, he was a stand up until that point. Well, he'd done Mark and Mindy. True. Which true, was. But he hadn't done any movies. Adjacent to acting. <laughs> what? Well, not really. He was just doing his shtick uh, for 22 minutes. Yeah, and then the, all the other actors in the show would stand around trying to figure out what they were supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, and trying not to laugh. Yeah. 
Jessica Miller says David Bowie in Labyrinth. Oh, yeah. Except he had been acting for a while already. Yeah, but he wasn't really known as an actor. He, no, he, and no, he was a musician. Yeah. His position in The Man Who Fell to Earth was so bizarre. Ooh, I'm not even boy. sure if you could consider it. A- I mean, I guess it was acting. Oh, but uh, we'll, come, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Professor Rebecca Pelkey says Tina Turner in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Not a great film, but no. she was great in it. I might By the way, Mike, be, who does run Bartertown? Uh, it's uh, Master Blaster. Just you know. What's that? Uh, Master Blaster, Ron Bartertown. Thank you. Yes, he does. <laughs> what is that smell? Mm. <laughs> kind of pee. It's either Ma- I think that's Blaster. I'm not sure. Oh, dear. I think Master let loose a Blaster. <laughs> um, Pig uh-oh. killer. <laughs> Val Coons, Coons, President, Lord, and Doyen of Q Footsteps, one of... If not the, no, not the, because that's us, greatest podcast out there, tells us, I'm going to go with a, a couple of more obscure names, Lyle Lovett and Sam Phillips. Really? Lyle was great as the detective in The Player. Oh, God, I forgot he's in that. Oh, that's yeah. right. Huh. Sam Phillips, female folk singer, was the mute but still very effective hench person in Die Hard with a Vengeance. No, it's not a great movie, but I thought she was... Great in a very unexpected role. I saw the movie. I don't remember her, but I don't remember most of that movie. She's mute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and she adds, I almost forgot. Alex Karras in Blazing Saddles. Mongo only pawn in Game of Life. What was he? Was he a football player? He was a football player. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That was, he went on to do other acting, but mm. that was, I think, his first actual role. Roland, the headless Thompson Gunner Hardy no. says... <laughs> I'm also going with Robin Williams and Garp. Okay. Hmm. Adam Mark says, Okay, here we hey go. Hey, kid, tell your old man to drag Walton and Lanier up and down the court for, for, for 40 minutes. Sorry, for 60, 48 minutes. Uh, the way this question is worded, I think it's looking for a true non-actor performance as opposed to performers whose primary gig is singing, etc. Uh, Either way. But, yeah, but but act semi-regularly, like Bette Midler, Dolly Parton, or Lady Gaga. <laughs> My vote is for... <laughs> she's so, not French. Sorry, sorry Clayface. Uh, I think she's from my Virginia. Vote, <laughs> my vote is for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in his cameo in Airplane. Really? It's a short role, but his comedic performance is amazing. His performance as the co-pilot who the little boy, by visiting the cockpit, recognizes as K.A.J., Ooh, aren't we hip? <laughs> Despite his increasing denials, is just so good, and then his snapping out of character to cuss out the kid's critical father is golden. It's one of my favorite parts of the movie. It's completely in sync with the rest of the film's relentless humor, but really stands out. K.A.J. just owns it. He's a natural in front of the camera. Yeah, okay, that is a great sequence. Mm, sure. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's fairly obvious that he's looking off camera to read his lines, but okay. Yeah, yeah, there is that. <laughs> I still like him in Game of Death, the movie that kind of stars Bruce Lee for maybe a third of it. Well, but that the only reason to watch that is because you can't imagine anybody that big being beaten with his reach, but mm. um, he, yeah, that's a great fight. That is a great fight. Yep, yep. Regan McStravick says, Vinnie Jones, the soccer player, in Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, among other things. And, of course, there were numerous musicians who made the crossover, especially rappers for some reason. Will Smith, LL Cool G, J, Ice-T, Madonna. Madonna's a rapper? <laughs> <laughs> There's something I don't want to hear. Yeah. Especially now. George Saulnier says, Dwight Yoakam in Sling Blade. Uh-huh, Basically uh-huh. unrecognizable and terrifying <laughs> as the abusive father. Yes, we would all like some French fried taters, please. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> No, normally, yep, 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 Did he really base his entire performance on a Muppet? <laughs> no, he might have, I don't know. Uh-huh. <laughs> A.J. Sheems? Ah, Shems, Shems is what I've heard, so. Shems, okay. There's Adam Sandler. Wait, what? Uh, but, In uh, both Punch Drunk Love and Uncut Gems. Really impressed me both times. I didn't expect it in the slightest bit. Okay, you could argue that, because in most of his other movies, he's doing his Adam Sandler comedy bits, but he actually tries to act in those two. Okay. I've never seen them. I'm told they're really good. They're Sandlerific. <laughs> <laughs> and, of cor- and, of course, master of penguins, gut puncher of walruses, 
and consumer of back bacon, Vince from the Great White North, says, I think I will have a small theme to my answer this week. The two main actors I thought were also rock stars first. Uh, David Bowie mm-hmm. is so perfect in The Man Who Fell to Earth and went on to prove he was good in any number of roles. The first role was the on- was on- one only he could pull off by giving the character a lot of depth where I think others might have been less subtle about it. The second is Bjork in Dancer in the Dark. No, I didn't see it. I never... I don't know that. OMG, what a performance. If you haven't seen it, take your antidepressants beforehand and have a supportive friend on ha- <laughs> on call to help you deal with the ending. Oh, okay. Dear. Why am I not shocked that an Icelandic woman made a depressing movie? Well, and remember, Vince is a huge fan of Werner Herzog and Vim Vendors. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Captain Cheerful. Yeah. Well, but can... those were terrific. But, Mike, what about you? Who's your favorite... Uh, or? Who really surprised you in a pleasant way? I'm going to go with Deacon Jones and the Odd Couple. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Really? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. He's uh, supposed to be an actor. I think, did he also show up in the Brady Bunch? I think he did. Yes, he did. He showed him. He's he, going to go. He showed up both times as uh, Deacon Jones. Yeah. The, uh, the famous uh, Deacon. The famous that Deacon Jones. Had he not appeared in the Brady Bunch and the Odd Couple, I would... Uh, Never have no heard idea of him. who he was. No, yeah. no. Yeah. I, you know, it's it's such a broad thing. I, I'm gonna just yank something out of last week and say currently Don Rickles, in, uh, in, in, but he was an actor. Not even at, that at that point. point. Even at that point, yeah, he, he was. He was, he was doing all those beach. Bl- yeah, he was doing all those beach blanket bingo movies. I'm sorry, that wasn't acting. That was typing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I couldn't pick anybody. I couldn't okay. think of anybody that. I mean, I didn't see A Star Is Born. Apparently, Chris Christopherson's actually really good in it. I'm, mm, I could yeah. easily pick Barbara Streisand for What's Up, Doc, except she won. Didn't she win an Oscar for uh, um, Hello Dolly? Not Hello Dolly, the other one. No. Was it Funny Girl? Funny Girl. I th- yeah, I, think, I don't think she won for Hello Dolly. Yeah, and she was nominated. She'd been nominated for many. Yeah. So I, she was still, yeah. and is to this day still mostly known as a singer, but I do love mm-hmm. her in that film. So mm-hmm. the, if you don't like Deacon Jones or um, Don Rickles or Barbara Streisand, then uh, I, <laughs> I don't know what to do. But what do you yeah. have as an answer? Well, uh, with all respect to Dave, uh, I love Truman Capote in Murder by Death. I mean, that's his only film role. He Good. is hilarious. <laughs> yes, but is it on purpose? I don't know. Who cares? I just enjoy it so much. But the other one I really like is Sam Kennison in the Rodney Dangerfield movie Back to School as the history professor who just keeps losing it on his students. How about Bobcat Goldthwait in Tape Heads? It's a tiny part, but he's really good it, in it. It is a very. He, think yeah, I can. No, I think are, I can. Cash think I flow. Can. Cash <laughs> flow. Cash <laughs> flow. That's right. Don well, Don Muzo. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Although he's listed in the credits as Jack Cheese. <laughs> he is. They don't mention Robert Goldthwait at all. Huh. It's just Jack Cheese. Well, there are a lot of them. Sure. I, I got to go with those. With the, those two are the most fun. Sure. But these were all great answers. Thank you, folks, very much. Very. I, oh yeah, uh-huh. and we want to hear more. Oh uh-huh. yeah, we want to hear more about a Kaiser blade. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> damn, I'm stuck in Billy Bob mo- mode. Billy Bob Levine. Uh, <laughs> Star Wars forever changed the science fiction genre. What movie was a genre game changer for you? Oh, could be another the same science fiction, but like, what changed a genre for you? Like and Deep House the end, or Rogue well, Warfare yes. Three. <laughs> Rogue Warfare it's 3 changed the Rogue Warfare genre forever. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it changed the Warfare genre and made it go rogue. <laughs> and at the end of the show, we'll tell you how you can answer this burning question. Ooh, painful rectal itch. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be good jam. <laughs> There's a deeper. Um, <laughs> 1970s Saturday Night Live. Uh, Ooh. But when it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. True, but harsh. <laughs> um, but now, there's things. The facts. Budget. This is w- up to this point, and I'm not sure he ever passed it. I have to check this on some others. He did. He did surpass this. This was up to the point, both uh, Roger Corman and New, was it New World Pictures' most expensive movie at two million dollars. Yeah. He made his money back. Box office took in about three point six 
And if you count video rentals over the next about 10 years, well, 20 or 30, if because there weren't any video rentals until the 80s, made over 11 million. Wow. Well, you know what? Yeah. Good for Roger. Yeah, good for him. He also sold the foreign distribution rights for three quarters of a million. Hmm. Most of that budget went for the salaries for two people, Robert Vaughn and George Papard. Yep. Carmen, you would you would think it went for the special effects. You would be wrong. Oh. So Corman approached several companies to do the special effects, but nobody would do it for less than two million. <laughs> well, yeah, he obviously so picked Corman, the right place, but we'll get back to oh, that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Corman then he decided, well, I'm gonna create my own special effects department. Wow. And uh he he hired a young model maker and uh, director who was later uh, basically fired, uh, he was fired twice and rehired twice. Uh, this kid named Jimmy Cameron. Mm, who, uh, you mean, yeah, I didn't think so. Nah. Jimmy Cameron, by the way, also, he, so he became the art director for the movie, built a lot of the models himself, and he hired a friend of his, this kid he, he who needed a job as a carpenter and a painter, uh, this kid named Effin Bill Paxton. Ah, oh, it's his yes. fault! <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bill Paxton worked on these sets and models and, and everything else on Battle Beyond the Stars. The bacon kind? <laughs> the bacon. <laughs> Sorry, another deeper. Uh, James Cameron also he began to notice something about Corman. If Corman showed up while they were still working on the sets, he hated them. Like, I don't like it. This is terrible. And he'd start firing people on the spot. Oh, dear. However, if he arrived and there was, the set was half finished, but nobody was working on it, he always liked them. So finally, what Cameron would do was have someone on lookout for Corman's car. And whenever it was spotted, he'd clear the set of crew members, no matter what state it was in. Corman would come in and go, yeah, this is good. <laughs> That's so weird. Apparently, he hated to see people working on it. I don't know. Huh. According to an interview with the... That star, Richard Thomas, mm -hmm. John Boy. Mm. Now, this this should not really come as a shock. The wardrobe department had a difficult time keeping the top of Sybil Danning's costume on. Yeah. And had to, yeah, had to resort to using Band-Aids to prevent said top from slipping off. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. This is considered, and with good reason to be the first, major theatrical film to be scored by one James Horner. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. He worked for, his last couple included, of course, Humanoids from the Deep and The Lady in Red, also Corman movies. Mm -hmm. This was his breakthrough science fiction adventure blockbuster, and he'd go on to do some minor films like Aliens, Titanic, Avatar, won a couple of Oscars for, for Titanic, and a lot of movies. And of course, he did do the score also for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Pretty cool. As the newscasters around the high holidays always say, for our Jewish friends, <laughs> there are a lot of inside jokes in this. I mean, Robert Vaughn's character's name is Geld, which in Yiddish translates into gold or money, from the German Geld, yeah. meaning money. Yeah. Uh, the written language which appears on the Malmori, the bad guy's screens, is Hebrew. And nice. Cayman, the lizard guy, his twin Kelvin assistants are named Urim and Thummim, which is mentioned once. Urim and Thummim are terms used in ancient Jewish traditions to designate parts of a high priest's robe, like the breastplate and the uh, crown part. Max, I, I hate to correct you, but they were actually, um, that was the name of Odin's crows, his ravens were... <laughs> That's Hugen and, Hugen and Munich. Thank you very much, you clod. I'm pretty sure. This is, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're a clod. Oh. Uh, the main body of the Hephaestus space station was made from a plastic terrarium salvaged from a dumpster. Man, you know, it's amazing what you can do with trash if you've got the skill. That's, that's really yeah. cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, you would not know. Now, this film does have some callbacks to... Well, and we'll get to this Magnificent Seven. Oh, oh. Not only, yeah, think about it. I was thinking Robert Seven Vaughan, Samurai, but yeah, same thing. <laughs> Robert Vaughn is actually in the Magnificent Seven as Lee, who is a character oddly similar to his character Gelt. Some of Gelt's dialogue is lifted almost verbatim from the Magnificent Seven. It's clearly being a tribute. Yeah. 
George Papard was originally considered to play Vin, the Steve McQueen character, in The Magnificent Seven. Hmm. Interesting touch. Yeah. The native, the good guys, or the, the planet victims of the evil Sador, are the na- are natives of the planet Akir, and they're known as the Akira. Yeah. This is, of course, a tribute to Akira Kurosawa, whose film The Seven Samurai served as one of the inspirations for this film. Hmm. Now, this one I just like. Remember Viewmasters? Sure. GAF. A, yep, GAF Viewmasters. This was a... I, I, I don't even know how you describe it. It was like a, a slightly jazzed-up slide viewer for per, personal slide Well, it was 3D. Viewers. That was the big deal. It was a 3D. Yeah, it, was like, it was like the 19th century stereoscopes, but smaller and more compact. In color. A, in color. A Viewmaster three-reel packet was issued featuring 21 images from this movie. Ooh. Yes, it's also the only one of Roger Corman's films to be marketed with a Viewmaster tie-in. How many movies were? <laughs> uh, not, not many. James Horner's score for this film was also used in the trailer for Roger Corman's unreleased film version of The Fantastic Four. We'll talk about that another time. Yeah, probably. And, yes, it was also reused in the 83 sci-fi film Space Raiders and the 1985 fantasy film Wizards of the Lost Kingdom, all Corman films. Both of those films also reused footage from Battle Beyond the Stars, one of Corman's cost-cutting trademarks when additional footage is needed. Hey, the man knew how to make a film cheap. He did. He always made money on his films. So I do have a question. Are you you done with your trivia? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I have a big question. Uh... This movie is Julia Duffy's uh, debut. She oh. plays his sister. Okay. Julia Duffy, for those of you who don't remember, played Steph on the show New Heart, a.k.a. Coppers! Oh! Yes. One of the assistant editors on this movie got this gig because he had a really rough stint playing a humanoid in Humanoids from the Deep. <laughs> <laughs> Which was released the same year. Was was this considered a, a bonus or something? Uh, possibly a punishment. No. I mean, having to, having, having to wear... Having to wear well, maybe wearing those humanoid suit was the punishment. Wow. Speaking of odd cameos, actress, comedian Kathy Griffin is seen in an early shot as an alien extra reacting to a spaceship landing. I looked for her, I couldn't see her, but she's apparently in there. Mm. Now, most importantly... This film was considered a major influence behind the short-lived animated series The New Adventures of He-Man, 1990. Uh, uh-huh. In that series, the peaceful planet Primus is under threat from the evil Flog and his mutants. Master Sebrian, the elderly leader of Primus, decides that they must find a great warrior to help deal with Flog and his evil mutants, and Hydro and Flipshot are sent to find that warrior, and that warrior they find to help in the crisis is He-Man. Okay. Fascinating. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's it. What was the question you wanted to ask? Well, so last week, you mentioned that you wanted to watch mm-hmm. this film, and we are, in fact, watching films directed by Roger uh, Corman. Yes. I'm and glad you brought that up. And this film, as I saw in the credits, was directed by Jimmy. <laughs> yes, Jimmy Murakami, <laughs> who, by the way, is was not really a director before this. He, However, he was an animator who has one absolutely legendary piece of animation that I know you know, and I bet a lot of people still remember. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? A one, a two, a three. (laughs) Crunch. That was him. Wow. Yes, he his name is on there. However, it is an open secret that uh, Roger Corman's fingerprints are all over this movie. He actually did a lot of the directing. He just didn't want to be credited for it. Okay. Yes. Because otherwise it wouldn't this count was, and we'd have to stop right yep. now. Yeah. <laughs> Turn this and show right ways, around and go right home. <laughs> <laughs> and Jimmy Murama- Murakami, who went on to direct a couple of other of Corman movies, really appreciated it. Corman wanted to give him the spotlight and give him the chance. You can One thing you can say about Corman, he never tried to steal the spotlight from anybody and he was perfectly willing to highlight other people. Is that me in the spotlight? <laughs> I think that's you in the corner. Oh, yeah, right, losing my religion. But uh, yeah, speaking yeah. of that... Oh, there it is. Tell us yep. a story. Mm-hmm. Tell us Now, I love it when people do a really good homage. So tell us a good homage, Max. Uh, oh. Welcome to the agrarian planet of Akir. Everything is nice there, and everyone lives by the code of the Varda. 
which is cunningly never explained. But then, horror! The evil John Saxon, I mean, I mean, <laughs> Sador, shows up and gives them a week, excuse me, seven cycles, to utterly surrender to him or he will use his solar converter not to provide cheap, clean electricity, but rather to destroy their entire world. Boo. Oh, noes! The Akirans realize they must fight, but basketball is a peaceful planet. They have no weapon. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's a deeper. Enter the innocent but brave farm boy Shad. Huh, why does that sound familiar? Yeah. Uh, he volunteers to take the planet's only spaceship, a sentient ship named Nell, and run away to safety. I mean, go out and hire mercenaries. That's what I would have done. Go out to hire mercenaries to protect Akir. Despite having basically nothing to offer, Shad manages to bring together a strange and diverse collection of fighters. A reptilian Zyme hunter, they're kind of like snipes, <laughs> named Cayman, five representatives of a clone hive mind named Nestor, Gelt, the cold-eyed professional assassin who just wants a place to hide, a folksy space cowboy from Earth, and a battle-hungry Valkyrie. Seriously, that's what her people are called, the Valkyrie who brings two major attributes to the fight. Oh, and a pretty blonde scientist lady. So Shad has someone to make out with. Together, they wage a desperate battle against overwhelming odds and devastating scenery chewing, culminating in an epic space battle from which only one victor may emerge. The film. So, Mike, had you seen this before? Yep. Where'd you see it? In the theater when it came out. Uh, yeah. See, I yeah. Well, that's the place to see it, so really. I mean, the small is, screen was okay, yeah. but I don't think it really does. Just, well, I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You do need the scope. I first saw it at a science fiction marathon. Oh, and I had not actually heard of this movie before that, but I think the marathon was in the eighties, so it wasn't like it was that late. Oh, and they were just showing it. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was like one of those special presentations where they have to spend a little extra money and get like an exclusive. Oh, that's cool. That was very cool. Yeah. Boy, man, I wish I'd... I mean, I just saw it in a regular theater with a couple of friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, you know, I got to see it with a bunch of, you know, excited fans and stuff. That's really oh, neat. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I've seen that. I, I probably have seen it some point between here and then. I mean, there's so many movies. You mm -hmm. can't rewatch them all. But yeah. yeah, it's been a long time since I... Have you seen it since the science fiction? I don't think I have. Oh, no. Oh, weird. I'm it surprised was, you didn't go back to really it. Yeah, it's sometimes it's hard to find. There was a lot of, of uh, difficulty with the rights oh. as to who owned what, so it didn't come out on video for a long time. Oh, he didn't um, forget to copyright this one. <laughs> no, he did, he did not. <laughs> that was weird. So yeah, uh, we got a we got a big cast this mm. week. A, a, we do, a, a, and we got some remarkable people in here. We do. We got George Papard. Yeah, the leader of the A team himself. Although I don't think he'd done that yet. No, I don't think so. That was later in the eighties. I think so. But he had done an awful lot of cowboy parts. Oh, sure. So this and war playing pictures. Space and, cow, yeah. Playing space cowboy wasn't that much of a stretch. Well, and he brings that sort of gravitas that you want to this part, right? I didn't think about gravitas. I think he was more comfortable, you know? Yeah, I could see that. He's the one He's very relaxed in it. He, he just sort of... He's the one who doesn't seem to be taking himself quite as seriously as the others. But I think that that's actually part of the character, and I think that, that he's trying to express mm. the idea that apparently us Earthers have a sense of humor, which apparently the rest of the ga galaxy does not. Yeah, but yeah, everyone else is pretty serious in this. So he brings, he's sort of a breath of fresh air. Yeah, yeah, he's, he does feel very comfortable in that way. Like an old, like, plaid shirt, flannel shirt that you mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Robert Vaughn? Yeah, I yeah, he talked about gravitas. Yeah, I think that he really embodies this character. Now, I didn't see Seven or uh, Magnificent Seven. I've only seen Seven. Oh, Samurai. really? Yeah. Mm. So I don't know his character from that. But this, you, I, I actually like the idea that he's this, you know, very mm. well known and very successful bounty hunter to the point that he's the only one left on his own planet. And what does he want for a payment? He wants a place to hide and a good meal. He like he's got no company. Yeah. He's and kind he's of sad. surrounded by treasure, but he has nowhere to spend yeah. it. And when you know, uh, Shad tells him, you know, all we can offer you is is a meal and a a, a safe place. He's like, yeah, you know, right now that sounds good to me. Yeah, it's kind of sad. I mean, it is. you get He's to the top of your game and character. yeah, what can you do? So. I, you know, I will say there's still that moral ambiguity he brings to the character, where is he fighting mm -hmm. for himself? Is he fighting for, to win against something and get something in return? Or is he? Is there actually a glimmer of hope that he's doing this because it's the right thing to do? Maybe. I want to get back to him, too, because yeah. the character's really interesting. Yeah. 
Then we got Richard Thomas, John Boy of the Waltons, and he is playing, he's going out a bit of a stretch on this one, although he is still kind of like the naive, wholesome farm boy. Yeah, I I think that, you know, the, the guy was really typecast in the show that he mm -hmm. was very successful in. If I remember correctly, he left the show before it ended. I think the last... I think I, I think because his character moves off or something. I, it's been a long oh, time. Yeah. But I think that Richard Thomas was feeling his being typecast and moved on. I don't think he didn't come back. I think there were times when he came back, but I don't, I don't remember it that well. But man, that is a tough role to get typecast in, right? Because yeah. if people only yeah. see you as John Boy, and I'm sure he got called John Boy for a long time. You yep. know, so taking a role in a science fiction film, I can understand him wanting to just kind of break free and stuff. And while the, the role is reminiscent i suppose if you want to mm -hmm. be that way uh i think he really takes the role and and tries to make it his own what do you think yeah i think that's right i think he's he's trying to stretch uh it is again the you know the luke skywalker farm boy in a strange situation <laughs> well i mean let, let's, but he does he becomes like a fighter he gets very badass toward the well end. and there's that moral thing again where he's like i can't use violence i can't be like that and his computer spaceship's like you're going to die if you don't and there's points mm -hmm. in your own code, this thing of the Varda, we'll get back to the Varda, that tell mm -hmm. you you're allowed to do this. You And I understand. And actually, it's kind of nice to see a hero for once being a little uptight about actually killing somebody. Cause, yeah, yeah, he doesn't want to. Yeah, mostly. He also, he doesn't want to shoot so, shoot in the back. Right. He won't shoot from behind. Uh, like, quite honestly, shooting in the front is um, um day. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, I, you know. Hats off to him for giving it a go after such a successful run on a very well known mm -hmm. and well loved show. Yep, we got to get to the villain, of course. Oh yeah, John Sador. Well, what, come on. I mean, the, with all of it, the name is a bit silly. I suppose, but, but it really uh, tells you everything you need to know about him, right? Yeah, right there, you do. You go in right away, and it's John Saxon, and John Saxon is clearly having a great time with his character. Well, have you seen John Saxon in anything? I mean. He's almost always the bad guy. The only time I ever saw him, he was a good yeah. guy. He actually was playing a date for Mary Tyler Moore, and I'm like... No, he's also a good guy in uh, Enter the Dragon with uh, Bruce Lee. Oh, I forgot that. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he's He is one of those solid, to be fair, B-movie actors. He never really mm -hmm. had a big part, yeah. but he is a solid... You can always count on John Saxon to, to do... You know what you're getting. Yeah. He is a solid, in this case, solid yep. bad guy, uh, well-named. He shows really no remorse at all for what he's doing, which is what you need in a part like that. And we got uh, Darlene, or Darlan, I'm not sure I even pronounce her first name, Flugel, Flugel. Do you know her? Who's n No, I don't. She's done a, She's got a surprising list of credits, but mostly she's a TV actress. Oh, okay. Uh, she plays Ninilia in this, the uh, basically love interest right. slash uh, smart person. Well, quite honestly, the one who occasionally gives Shad a good kick in the pants, which he needs. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Now, I will admit, the next actor I know you're going to yeah. is better yeah. known for horror films. And all through the yeah, film, up, I'm yeah. like, is, is that really her name? Is her name Saint X-Men? That can't yeah. be right. Uh, basically, well, it is. It's X-Men, but yeah. I know, but I, just, I kept thinking Charles Xavier, Cyclops. There's a Saint. Yeah, line yeah. I don't remember that character in the X-Men. I bet there's one. there's been one since. There are a lot of mutants these days in the comic book. But yes, that is Sybil Danning, the Scream Queen also... Um, this was one of the few movies she actually keeps most of her clothes on. Most of the time. Yeah. Um, this was a bit of a turning point for her, because before that she was always the sexy mistress or the bad girl who lies around naked a lot, and she became much more of an action star after this. Yeah, and, I, you know, they mm -hmm. take... There's a lot of really cool influences, different cultures that are... Oh, you talked about the Jewish element earlier. Well, she's mm -hmm. bringing in, you know, Germanic culture with the whole Valkyrie thing, and where she... The whole... We're, we're warriors, and our whole thing is to fight as well mm -hmm. as possible and then die gloriously, right? So You have to wonder if, like, uh, maybe Gene Roddenberry borrowed a little of that for the Klingons. Well, except that Star Trek came out... 14 years no no i mean for next generation oh the, oh, the, oh oh yeah yeah, yeah. the whole honor and yeah, yeah i could mm. be you yeah. know i never thought of that mm. you may have a point there um because next gen wouldn't show up till 87 but so right huh right there's uh dr hephaestus or Sh sam jaffe who's got an incredibly long oh dear god he's been in everything everything yeah. he's again one of those actors is oh that's that guy from that thing and he's fine he i think he has four lines and then we never see him well again. he's ahead 
Let's be fair. Yes. Most of him does not appear yeah. in this film. Uh, that being said, <laughs> we're bringing in another culture. We're making reference to yeah. ancient Greek culture. And, of course, Hephaestus was the, the sure, smith of the, the gods. God. Mm -hmm. um, and he is the guy who's making stuff. He's an android builder. I was a little sorry that yep. we didn't do I'm always sorry when we don't do a little bit more with android stuff and, you know, the whole idea mm. of identity and whether they're real people or not. And, of course, we actually don't see them use the androids after that, which I thought was kind of a shame. Well, they sort of disappear. Yeah. So unfortunate, but you know they only could fit so much in. That there's Morgan Woodward mm. as Cayman. Did you recognize? Well, of course you wouldn't recognize me. He's under a remarkable makeup job. Yeah, but uh, Morgan Woodward, I thought you might know from Star Trek, the original show, because he plays two different people in it. He's not Doctor Van Gelder, is he? Yes, he oh, is. Okay. He's Doctor Van Gelder from Dagger of the Mind, and he's also Captain Tracy from the Omega Glory. Oh, that's right. The Yangs and the Combs. Interesting back, because I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. Morgan Wo mm -hmm. Woodward went through so much actual psychological turmoil in playing Dr. Mm -hmm. Van Gelder that he actually had to go into therapy. And it was actually a oh, very true. Really? Yeah, because he really poured himself into that role. And he's wow. really, really good in it. It's a kind of shame that we don't get to see his face. Although, even with makeup, you get a lot of feeling for what's basically meant to be a reptilian creature right and the idea of mm. reptiles is that they don't have they don't have feelings because they're cold-blooded or i don't know but mm. i think he actually takes what could have been a throwaway role and really makes it his own yeah he doesn't have a lot to do nope. but he throws himself into it yeah uh the only one of the major actors i want to mention is the lead nestor you know the uh well I've, i'm the, used to that was earl bone i'm used to seeing him with a little fence in front of his face because <laughs> he's the next door neighbor <laughs> on um uh, what is it that uh, oh, Tool Time with, Tim Allen? Yeah, the, Tim Allen's show, uh, the Home the, Improvement. Yeah, really? Because I know him mostly from the Terminator movies, where he's the psychiatrist, right? And boy, is he a jerk in that? Is it? He, he is. Maybe but he's, he's not the guy from Home Improvement. I didn't think he was. I thought he was. I think that's someone else. Oh, that's all right. He does a lot of voice acting, but yeah, I actually uh, like there. I mm -hmm. like the fact that they made all of the Nestor kind of look like him. Because they do. Yeah, they did. They tried. They tried to restructure the faces to make it look a little more like him. Yeah. And uh, just a couple of others. I mean, there's so many people in this oh, movie. Oh, yeah, man. You know, Jeff Corey, another character actor. He plays Zed the Corsair. Yeah. Oh, and he too has been in everything. Yeah, he's been in everything. And looks, one of the uh, Akirans, is Marta Kristen, a.k.a. Judy Robinson from Lost in Space. Yeah. It's, I mean, I don't know if she, it's maybe she likes gimmicky, space things and she wanted to keep going maybe. with them. I got to point out, if you go to IMDB, there was one character who doesn't have any lines. He's just a very large man in a very small oh, costume named Quopeg, Quopeg, which I'm guessing yeah. is a reference to uh, Moby Dick, just yeah, saying. I believe so. But his, cause, yeah, there, his photo mm. on IMDB is just of his crotch. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't say anything. He just stands there and looks muscly. I think he was a bodybuilder. I'm guessing so. And he just, you know, yeah. he looks pretty. Oh, oh honey, right. don't talk. He's he is very quick, quick. He's got a harpoon. He's got tattoos. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the one, and uh, the last one I want to mention is Lynn Carlin, who is the voice of Nell the Spaceship. How is that not Majel Barrett? I don't know. They, it was made for her. Well, it sounds like her. I thought it was it her. It does. And then I was like, maybe nope. she had used a stage name, but I don't. do we know Lynn Carlin from anything? Was she? She's Kirk? done a ton of TV stuff, well, but uh, she doesn't have a lot of major roles. Was she the no. wife of Elliot Carlin from the Bob Newhart show? I do not think so. <laughs> Shut up, Hartley. <laughs> I do not think so. So we've got a big no, cast, no. and with, you know they yeah, all are bringing cast. different flavors. You know, it's it's like stone soup, right? Everybody brings something to the pot, yep. and you get something amazing because of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. So we should uh, we should. Oh no, we want one of the things uh -huh. we wanted to talk about was the Varda. So they have this mm. code, and there's a yeah. couple of things in there. One of them, and this is actually pretty smart, especially for people that are considering themselves nonviolent. Um, one of the first thing, I think it's the first law of the Varda, to fight creatures of violence, you must use creatures of violence. So, mm. and this is not entirely unlike the original Seven Samurai because they were farmers, right? And they're like, well, yeah, we, we literally we don't know how to fight. We're not allowed to. I think under that, the law at the time in that era of Japan, they weren't owned to have... They weren't allowed to own weapons, yeah. yeah. So they had to find you know, people of violence, in this case, samurai or ronin or whatever. And that's what they're doing here. So, you know, I can totally, it's, it's a way of 
understanding something that goes against your own code, but also being willing to use it. It shows a, a sort of moral flexibility that I found interesting in a in a code mm. like this. That was impressive. Yeah. Now also, I, I was curious, you know, the, the name Varda sounded familiar. Yeah. It's actually from Tolkien. Oh. In the Silmarillion, oh, right. Varda is one of the Valar. That's yeah, right. One of the gods. Right. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, he, you know, Corman had read Tolkien. Yeah, uh, you know, that's entire. I mean, it's a genre film, and he was into a lot of different genres, so that's oh, yeah. yeah, that's totally possible. So we have this this nice moral code that lets us know a lot about the main character Shad and his people without mm -hmm. having to just spell it out. Occasionally, they do, you know, quote little bits of the Varda, but that's okay. It's and I think it's also interesting that that's how the ship has been programmed, right? So Nell, mm -hmm. the ship, and it's... She also knows the Varda. I mean, it's like, I don't know, trans putting in the Torah into your spaceship. Well, and the, doesn't this in a way reflect back from Isaac Asimov's three roles, rules of robotics, right? Like the... If yep, you're gonna that which... That which does not live cannot cannot harm that which does live. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's right out of the... That's the first law of robotics. Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of attention being paid to science fiction in print on the screen and, you know, just general world cultures, which is kind of interesting. And that Varda, I think, is sort of the center of it. Um, we never mm -hmm. actually find out if the... I assume the Varda is the text as opposed to the actual... Like, maybe there was a being that was also... I don't know, yeah. but... It's, it's left very ambiguous, which is a nice touch. The audience can fill it in themselves. Yeah. Not actually knowing, yeah. Uh, one of the sequences, I, I, I want, this is a jump off, but I wanted to come back to Gelt. Oh, right, okay. Because he, he's actually a really interesting character. There's the sequence where, right before battle, these two kids come over to talk to him. Right. And they're like, Mr., are you a bad man? And they're like, why? Why are you bad? And he has this very interesting line... If you think different, you get called bad. That's really because because of who I I work for. I hear that phrase mm -hmm. "think different," and I'm like, yeah. I don't know if we were ever called bad, but sure. But no, but it's no. I can see that though. The idea is that that which is not understood is often called evil or wrong. Yeah, true. That's a very interesting uh, philosophical and psychological uh, point they bring. Oh up. man, I wonder if he's trying to make a cultural comment there. Just it might be. I mean, this is. Post seventies, uh, yeah, and we haven't. Hit, I mean, a, with Stonewall riots have already happened, of course, and gay rights are still mm -hmm. a thing, uh, and black rights are a thing. So, yeah, I wonder if that's what that's meant to be. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, we've uh, got a. To be fair, I, you know, I we can't be all nice to to Roger here. The story mm -hmm. is one that has had some tread to it's it. Been, it's been done, but it's a kind of an homage. The way you could argue. That uh, the Magnificent Seven is basically a re ripoff of Seven Samurai, or you can say it's an homage or a retranslating into a different genre, which is kind of what's happening here. We went from samurai movie to western to science fiction. Well, and this reminds me of the whole thing I was, I was going to mention this earlier about the whole hero has a thousand faces and that whole thing, and how there mm. is a certain story or type of story in nearly every culture on the planet starting way back from you know when we first wrote things so the you know sure. um, Go back to Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh yeah. and, and his buddy uh, Enki who uh, were not at all gay <clears throat> but uh, the heroes <laughs> the stories that we've been telling are the same stories all through time and all Roger Corman is mm -hmm. doing is taking and actually like, because he's bringing in bits of other cultures he's almost saying hey this is the story, right? This is the one mm -hmm. we all tell. I'm telling you this because I'm using Jewish references. I'm using old Gr ancient Greek references. I'm pulling stuff from from Tolkien. So, uh, you know, it's... Even on two million... I mean, two million sounds like a lot, but of course, even in 1980, that was pretty much next to nothing. We're starting to get into yeah, the blockbuster Yeah, what was Star age. Wars's budget? It was like eight. But that was, even, that was a, a lot. Now, well, to be fair, he had a major studio backing him. New World, I think, mm -hmm. was Roger Corman's studio. So he had, yes, to, it was. he had to scrape up the money himself. And, you know. If, yeah, um, no, it was done in his studio, in, which was basically a lumberyard. Wow. Okay. Because yeah. you know, you've got some pretty expansive sets here. You know, you've got the entire planet, you know. the Akir, and then you've got all yep, the, the different trench spaceships. warfare sequences. Yeah, yep. and that whole that, that space satellite ship. thing from uh, where the head was, Doctor Hephaestus. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. No, nope, some of the, I was going to say the, the two million dollars is work, right yeah. there. We we can see it you all see on it. the screen. You can. It's all up there. It's very impressive. I did want to talk about Nestor. There's an interesting uh, idea. The 
This is like before the Borg and everything. And they're a hive mind. Right, they're, they're, they're clones. Basically, and they, but there's only, they, as they say, there's only one Nestor. Right. And like he, he just has multiple bodies. Which I have to say is an interesting way to sort of decrease the tension a little, because when we, and undercut the tragedy when we see them die, because Nestor isn't dead, it's just those units are dead. Well, and, and they, it doesn't matter, because he says there are hundreds of thousands of him. They actually come up with a really clever plan to try and take down Sador. They basically know one of Sador's things mm -hmm. is that he's having parts of himself replaced because he doesn't want to die. He wants to live forever, which, you know, that's fairly mm -hmm. common with a lot of villains. And they yeah. send a Nestor, or they get a Nestor that's taken aboard Sador's ship, and it turns out that Sador, one of his arms, is bad. So they're, they're, they figure they'll probably replace it with one of Nestor's, and then they can control it. And they're almost successful. They almost get him. I was, yeah. just, I was on the edge of my... I'd totally forgotten that part. That was very tense, where he tried. they tried to make him cut his own throat yeah and they don't you know, mimic the entire all the uh, gestures and yeah it's it's really edge of your seat kind of kind of scene and it was also just very clever it's like you know we we mm. are all nestor so one part of us doesn't we is worth sacrificing to maybe take down this you know horrible menace and set yeah. it's close but doesn't quite make it so no and their their motivation is unique in, among the group, he also, you know, some of them are out for money or revenge or because they owe Shad a debt. Nestor wants to do this because it's interesting, because they're such an advanced intellect, they can get, they get bored, and they're worried about being literally bored to death. Yeah. So, they want to get involved. Yeah. And, you know, St. Xman, that's, you know, she, it's a little, she's a little two-dimensional. Yeah, but, uh, but you know, there's so many characters uh, here, you can actually give them the They leeway. don't have a lot of time to develop everybody. I mean, it's similar in uh, The Magnificent Seven. You don't, everybody doesn't get a lot of backstory. And I remember, but, but actually, in, in Seven Samurai, it's, of course, it's, um, oh, dear God, it's the big actor, the Japanese actor, um, Toshiro Mifune. It's all in his body language. He's like mm. this restless dog, and you instantly know all about him just by the way he moves yep. and to be fair we don't Absolutely. have anybody exactly of that caliber here we have but uh, we get some of that physicality from is, george Papard and she is similar though because it's just and it's the same in magnificent seven with the chico character in that the others like uh shad doesn't want her along like you're not going to be of any use you know go away yeah and she persists the way tashira mifune per persists yeah, I was, until finally he accepts her. I got to admit that part of the, the the script. I I have to admit I found a little. Really, you're going to turn somebody away? You're like you've that nothing to pay. That was a little pay. confusing. And I'm not sure what they were saying there. What yeah. I don't know what Roger was going for in that. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah, a little bit of his message was lost. I don't. I don't want to mm -hmm. degrade the film too much, but just yeah, yeah. that that mm -hmm. was an interesting point. Um, I'm just about out of um my notes here. What about yeah. you? We should get to that I, part. We should let I, people. Yeah. Well, what we actually thought. The finish. <laughs> so, Max, <laughs> what do you think of this film? <laughs> oh, my God, does this movie suck. It's so awful. Oh, oh Lord. I didn't think we could keep this up the whole show. I, very, I, I, very, kudos to you, sir. You, you <laughs> oh, it's only because I had to edit oh. out all the parts where I started laughing. <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, Never okay. mind that this is a shameless ripoff of like 90 different movies. <laughs> and not a good one. A and I do have no. to apologize. We lied. We lied to you. <laughs> oh, we lied so big. <laughs> but it was just, you know, it was my, it, Mike thought it'd be funny and I think it's, I think it worked. I do. It's so I easy really to do. rip a movie apart. Uh, and I don't know mm -hmm. how much people actually enjoy that. So to be fair, at the last minute. <laughs> I texted Max and said, hey, you want to try and pretend that we liked it? <laughs> and he was like, um, I don't know if I can. <laughs> so kudos yeah, to whole, you. for the whole show. <laughs> oh, thank you. There was a couple Dang. of times, because we do this, we can see each other. It's a couple of times where I had to quickly jump in because Max was losing it. <laughs> yep. But yep. Max, you saw this a couple of yeah, years after it came out. I did. <laughs> what did you think? <laughs> Oh, even then, I remember thinking, why does that ship look like a uterus with boobs? 
I, I just, I'm sorry. You really. This is very late, Corman, because obviously he said, "All right, you can have mercenaries. One of them has to have huge boobs, yeah. and so does one of the ships." <laughs> It is a really disconcerting design, oh. James Cameron. I, yeah, you, thanks, James. It's like, eyes up here, eyes at the guns. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> it is just so weird. It's just, it's not yeah. even like, you know, some, they say that cars can some, oh, that car is like a woman, the curves and everything. And they're yeah. just very, this, they're just like, we're going to take a ship, which is basically a cardboard box, <laughs> stick two moose antlers and some boobs on it. Get your tape out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. And the rest of the yeah, ships... Yeah, the thing is like, hello, this ship is female. You can tell by the voice and uh, by the boobs. Yes. Yeah, and the rest of the ships have Ugh. no aesthetic quality at all. It's literally like James Cameron took mm -hmm. some Tupperware, some glue, and shoved it in some model parts. Because it's just, they're awful. There's one that looks I like a giant also, fish. Yeah. yeah, you know, Sador's scout <laughs> ship, whatever, they look really familiar. I think they've used them in... I think we saw them in Star Crash and a couple of others. It wouldn't surprise me. Beat me with your Sador stick. The design stick. is exactly the same. <laughs> Did you, did you also notice some of the sound effects? Like uh, when Star Cowboy Trek, Ship yeah. starts up, it sounds like, yeah, phasers. And yep, yep. at one point when one of the pew pew guns is going, it sounds exactly <laughs> like photon torpedo. I swear to God, by the way, one of those ship guns, when it's firing, literally was going pew pew. <laughs> that's, that's not the same thing. Uh, yep, yep. The acting, I, the one actor I'm actually going to give credit to is Robert Vaughn. Mm. I think he actually Robert somehow. Robert Vaughn really does. He comes out of this without stuff stuck to him. I don't know. <laughs> But no. Poor Richard I mean, Thomas. I George think he's McCartan, trying, but he's just but not. I don't know what was going through his mole when he thought of taking this part. <laughs> That's you know, just it's mean. just. I'm sorry, but it's. Yeah, George, it's John Boy in space. Yeah. I guess he just was having trouble getting work. George Pappard is moist. <laughs> He's very... George Pappard at least looks like he's having a good time. Except that hat. He, what is with that hat? That hat. Well, the other thing that kind of didn't age very well is you notice there's a Confederate flag painted yeah, on his spaceship. Yeah. yeah. And hey, they don't quite say kiss, what is kiss, show me kiss, but it's yeah, it's hanging she out. She does in the wings. almost. <laughs> and she we almost have these space does. And Amelia actually says, Do you, does yours does your form have kissing? Yeah. <laughs> we, and then we have these uh, space battles. And there's one thing you don't oh want a space boy. battle to be, and that's dull. But even these worse are so than that. Dull. You don't want to pause in the middle of it to um, pause. Because <laughs> they, yeah, they do. They sort of hang out. They're like, oh, well, we didn't win yet, so we're going to get down to the planet and we're going to talk. Maybe have some trade negotiations. And then we'll get back to our <laughs> amazing space battle, which for the most part doesn't have two ships on the screen at the same time because it's more expensive. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. It's all ship. One ship, two ship, one ship, two ship. Yep. I do have a couple of uh, favorite quotes from this film. Oh, Sador, you, you son choose? of a bitch, here I come. <laughs> Probably This is Space Cowboy <laughs> from this planet Earth. Oh Lord. I was I gotta give Papard credit. He said that with a straight face. I and guess I bet he didn't do that on the first take. Sure. Uh, and then that quote I had earlier to fight creatures of violence, you must you Huh? The Varda obviously is just uh, another word for screenwriter. That's the only thing I could think yeah, of. But yeah. my favorite, and I hope that this will uh, become a favorite of yours for years and years to yeah. come. Wait for uh -huh. me in the Lambda Zone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I still like when when they're trying to be sexy. And Saint Xman, who in addition to Saint being the you know, yeah, the Klingon warrior who's sure. into you know battle and death and glory, it also is also really into talking about sex with Nanelia. Yeah. In the most unerotic ways possible, where she's comparing it to like engineering. Yeah. I, and, and, also, and of course, her hmm? just just with Saint X Men. Yeah. You, even as a how shall I put this, not entirely straight man, I couldn't help but <laughs> stare, waiting for that nipple to just pop out because it really, she really was a wanted wait, to. Oh, she was a wardrobe malfunction waiting oh, to happen. Man, and, oh god! <laughs> and even when they try to get the. Uh, what is it when she's talking about you about uh, a glorious death? Or oh, they never say death, by the way. No. They always say end. Yes. It's like they don't say life form, they say forms. And she's in uh, John Boy says, no death, no ending is glorious. And she says, you've never seen a Valkyrie go down. <laughs> hey <-o! laughs> Well, and then we get the Nestor. My note was, here we have the marshmallow people from Planet Fluffernutter. I mean, what the <laughs> hell was going on with that? Honestly, there's a sort of interesting idea behind that, but... 
the way they did it, where they're all trying to move in unison and they're just not. Yeah, I the, one the bit where they're trying to do chew. comic. Yeah, yeah, the bit where they're trying to do the joke about a hot dog. You know, Space Cowboys giving one to say hydro. He lists off the uh, all of the artificial ingredients. They go, that's what we call meat back home. Yeah, except that meat is not one of the <laughs> ingredients. It's not <laughs> even a veggie dog. I don't know what that is. Yeah, but oh, yeah, what is it? I wrote it down. It's hydrolyzed vegetable protein, soybean meal, niacin, dextrose, and sodium nitrate flavoring. Yeah, mm. I don't know what that is. It's pink. <laughs> One of the things also you should never, ever do, and that is use things that you can easily buy and remember seeing in a Spencer's Gifts in your spaceships. Because mm. <laughs> your eyes oh, go God, right to... Oh, the Vandegraaff to, generators. Yeah, <laughs> the little glass spheres that, quote unquote, <laughs> do something. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I gotta go do some shoplifting at Spencer's Gifts. You wanna come? Because... <laughs> Yeah. Oh Lord. And you know, there are times oh, the, when the, we the names. Yeah. Sador. I mean, names. come on. And, Shh. and what and of course his medical officer whose name is I don't remember. Daco. Oh yeah. Daco. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like oh, okay, Daco over there with Bilbo and Frodo. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, the one I didn't get was Shad. What's that? Well it's a kind of fish. Is but, it? Which is kind of you know, yes, you know, because he's limp and wet and well, he comes from the planet of the seventies people. I've never seen a yeah. beige world in my life. <laughs> Yeah, really, his character's name should have been Chad, but... <laughs> Cayman? Oh, I get it. He's a lizard, so Cayman. Yeah. Uh, okay, I get it. And then the Kelvin, because yeah, yeah. they get hot. <laughs> yeah. The only thing yes. in this film see, that gets hot. That could have been interesting. <laughs> could it? Yeah, they, they communicate <laughs> via degrees of heat. Could it? Which then makes you wonder, how could anyone understand them? Yeah. And apparently... By the way, if you apparently heat someone, they turn into purple sparkles. Yeah, they were sparkled to death. I didn't understand that either. There's one. There's a point, lot of sparkling in this movie. There was one character, I, I think it's actually Robert Vaughn, who says he's worried he, he doesn't yeah. want to become bored to death. And my note is... Um, uh, no, that, that's Nestor. James, uh, take... Or not James, uh, Roger, take that out of the script. Don't have any character yeah. say bored to no. death in this film. Because no. this movie no, is really boring. <laughs> so dull. All right, so we've, dull. We've, we've, we've had our fun. Yeah. <laughs> but we quite did, honestly, we, we deserve this movie quite we have a no bit. idea how hard it was not to laugh and to make it sound like this Ugh, film had any redeeming God. qualities at all because it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So, but um, yeah, what well, you know what does have redeeming qualities is our poll question, Max. Would you please yes. go over our poll question again? Sure. Star Wars, not Battle Beyond the Stars. <laughs> Star Wars forever changed the way, so, the, forever changed the science fiction genre. What movie was a genre game changer for you? And you can answer this question. You can email us directly at us at maxmikemovies.com. You can go to our website, maxmikemovies.com, and leave a comment. You can also find us on the Facing Books of Faceness. Facebook is just under called Max Facebook. Oh. I'm going to edit you out, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> under Max Mike Movies, and you can find us on the podcast of Bumpy's Choice everywhere. <laughs> but we are barely halfway through our tribute to the Core Man. We're actually exactly halfway what through. Is a, but... <laughs> yes, we are in fact exactly halfway through. I, I lied. You but won't. the show isn't over, so we're not technically half. We're not halfway through yet. <laughs> and we've done a lot of lies so, in this episode. Uh, yes, we have. That's just so, to make sure you what paid Corman attention. Master <laughs> What Corbin masterpiece are we going to check out next week? Well, we're going to go back. Back in time. In time. We're going to go back to early Corman. We're talking not even Ooh. 60s Corman. We're going to 50s Ooh. Corman. Yeah. Ooh, proto Corman. Yeah, I believe it's 50s Corman. And uh, okay. we're gonna, this is one of his bigger titles. And to be fair, it's a film I've Ooh. never seen. I know almost nothing about, except that it's in black and white. Ooh. We are going to watch Bucket of Blood. Oh, God, really? Here's the thing. I don't uh, think it's what, about what you think it is. Really? Yeah. Okay. I don't think... I assume it's just a gore, a gore fest horror movie. Well, I mean, a 50s gore fest, which means, you know, I don't know, tertiary syrup. Well, it's black and white, so how gory can it be? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what they used for blood back then. They used Hershey syrup. Sure. Well, and Hitchcock used it. Maybe this will be okay. like that. Maybe this is going to be Roger mm. Corman's Hitchcock-esque picture. Or... It's, I'm going to go on a limb and say, you're wrong. <laughs> or it's going to be a bucket of something else. But this is... <laughs> a steaming bucket of something else. Oh, Bumpy, will you fill the bucket, please? <laughs> uh, it, tune in next week to find out, was it a bucket yep. of blood or a bucket of Bumpy?
This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench. And now we're halfway through.